it said, yes, the, 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 we have a brysa. It says a person's not allowed to put tefillin under their feet because of desire, but you are allowed to put it under one's head. But if a person's wife is with them, that's prohibited. So that contradicts part of Shmuel's statement. Shmuel's statement was even with one's wife, you could have the tefillin under, one, under one's head. And uh, the brysa said, no, if you're with your wife, that's not allowed. So, and then the brysa said, uh, that if there's a the place in the room that's like uh, attached to the bed, that's a little uh, um, type of shelf or something that's either three tfachim above it, three hand breaths, approximately like nine or 10 inches above it or below, <laughs> that would be permissible to put the tefillin there. Again, we have to be talking about that the tefillin is double wrapped. And um, and that was one of the, so, so on this, it seems like it contradicts Shmuel's statement, because Shmuel said, you're allowed to be with one's wife with the tefillin, and this Brisa says you're not. And the Gemara says, Tiyufta de Shmuel, Tiyufta proves Shmuel wrong. And then the Gemara Rava said, even though Shmuel's proved wrong, the halacha is like him. We explained yesterday how that could be. How could we pass him like Shmuel if he's proven disproven? And uh, uh, I explained uh, two, two explanations yesterday that uh, we could still pass him like Shmuel, even if the, even if the, even though he was disproven. And um, one of the explanations was uh, because Shmuel was felt in the category that he was able to uh, argue with the Tanoyim in certain scenarios. And the other, the other explanation was that he has a source from a earlier uh, rabbi from the Tanoyim. So therefore, since he had a source from a, from a Tana, which is the Brisa that, excuse me, that we learned uh, earlier on, so that there was a discussion earlier about bringing tefillin into a bathroom, which also shows that you're allowed to, uh, that when it comes an issue of a challenge between disgracing the tefillin or safety for the tefillin, safety comes first. And that's what Shmuel is holding here as well. It's an issue of disgrace for the tefillin or safety of the tefillin. And here, uh, he didn't want to put them somewhere else. There's mice, there's other uh, issues. But here under his bed, he felt it's safe. Therefore, under his pillow, and therefore, um, the Shmuel is really following another Tanoic source, and that's why he's allowed. That's why he would be able to argue with a with a Tana. So even though the Gemara says to Yufta, we've proven him wrong, but really there is a source for Shmuel among the Tanoim. So it's really not totally proven wrong. So those are the two explanations. And uh, I think yesterday Ezra had a question. He said maybe you could explain the uh, second Brisa that it's talking about that the tefillin is not covered. And that's why with one's wife, it would be, it would be uh, uh, prohibited because the tefillin wasn't double covered. And maybe that's why it doesn't say clearly that it's double covered. In the first case where Shmuel is saying it's permissible with one's wife, that's a case where it's double covered. Sounds like a very good answer. The only thing is uh, the commentaries ask his question. So he's asking a good question. And the answer that, one of the answers that they give a number of answers, one of the answers that they give is, you see from the fact that if it's um, uh, three tfachim uh, above the bed or three tfachim below the bed, there it said that it's permissible to have tefillin. And it must be talking about a case where it's double covered. Because if it wasn't double covered, then you wouldn't be allowed to have tefillin uh, on the ledge of the bed, even if it's three tfachim above or three tfachim below. You're not allowed to have it in the same room. So it must be that we're talking about that it's double covered and yet, if uh, if it's um, if it's uh, if one's with one's wife, even though it's double covered, you're not allowed to have the tefillin under one's head. It would be allowed in the si on the side ledge, but it won't be allowed under one's head, under one's pillow, uh, if one's with one's wife. And therefore, it's a contradiction to Shmuel. But yet, we've explained that the halacha still follows Shmuel. And the Gemara's answer of explaining why why does the Gemara says why the Gemara answers on the top line anything that's for safety. The terinu tfei adif, it's more important than the, um, the disgrace that the tefillin is going to have. It's more important to save from the mice and from the ganovim than from, than from the fact that it's going to be uh, a little disgraced. So that was the conclusion. I see we have two people with their hands up. Uh, uh, I think, Susan, you were first. Who are the tanoim? Or what is a tanoim? The, Tana, the Tanoim are the authors of the Brisa and the Mishnahs. The Mishnah and the Brisa, the Tanoim, they're the earlier rabbis. And they were, the Tanoic period ended in the year 200. And the uh, Amoiroim are the later rabbis. They are from the year 200 to the year 500. So those oh. are the two 
groups of rabbis that we deal with in the Gemara, we generally deal with rabbis of the Tanoim or the Amoyim. The Tanoim are the earlier rabbis that ended around the year 200. The later rabbis are the uh, rabbis from the year 200 to the year 500, Amoyim. And they can't argue with each other under normal circumstances. The right. later rabbis have to accept what the earlier rabbis established. Yes, right. uh, Robert. Thank you. Uh, um, there's a lot here to uh, assimilate. So the question I have is, is with his wife a euphemism for having relations with his wife or being in the presence of his wife? Is, is there a distinction between being, you know, sleeping with your wife versus having relations with her? So, so the, uh, the, it's a good question. The, the thing is that um, it could be that sleeping with her could lead to relations. Okay. And therefore, it's, but it's all because of relations. The prohibition is the relations. One would not be allowed right. to have tefillin in the room because of the relations. Now, if they're not planning on having relations, but, they're, but, they, are, uh, but they are together, that would be your question. Uh, would that be allowed to have the tefillin under, under one's, one's head based on this Gemara? Uh, does it really mean just she's with him or does it mean they're actually physically planning on having relations and the simple reading is that it, it just being with one's wife because it might lead to having relations you shouldn't have you shouldn't have they shouldn't be uh, under one's head but the the the, the 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 problem is the relations it's not being with, right. uh, with one's wife yes uh isaac isaac hey. good morning good morning um, i can't see anything because I left my glasses in my bedroom. Um, I once had a Rebbe who drew a pyramid on the blackboard. He said, let's start on top with Moshe and Hashem on top of the mountain and then work your way down. Now, not only can somebody who's lower not contradict somebody that's higher, <laughs> You can't argue against what's on top of you, no matter what. Well, not no matter what, but generally. And time-wise, when you're going down the mountain, you can't just do things to things that are before you, where you, the path you took. You can't undo the path you took to where you are. So time-wise, the earlier you are, the higher up you are in the mountain, the more authoritative you are. And those are basically the general rules about halacha, about rabbis, about Torah. Uh, and you can put it all into a very simple picture. Look who came before you and look when they came. Were they closer to the source or further to, from the source? We commonly say, well, we're you know, more sophisticated because we're here now and they were back then. It's just the opposite in terms of the reality, at least of the things we learn about, mitzvahs, non-material things, anything that's not football is on a different level. You can't just measure it in that simple way. That's all. Thank you very much. Have a good Shabbos. No, no, Isaac, just explain what your main point is in like one sentence. I'm trying to give the woman who asked you the question uh -huh. a clear way of understanding anything she comes in contact with in halacha. Uh -huh. The first things you have to ask is, according to whom? Who were they? When were they? Uh -huh. And you can evaluate almost any question that is presented to you. I'm sure somebody can come up with an exception somewhere, but as a general rule to conduct your life day to day, it's just a principle to follow, very basic principles to follow. Right. Okay. Now, I do want to go back. Okay. Thank you so much, Isaac. That's a good point, uh, Susan. I hope that uh, helped a little as well. Um, Robert, you asked a question, and I don't think I answered you properly. Uh, okay. you, 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 asked, I, I, you asked, what would be the law if they're together, but, but they're not planning on having relations, uh, based on how I, I changed your question around a little. 
what would be if they're together in bed, but they're not planning on having relations? Uh, would they be allowed to have the tefillin under one's head, according to the Bryce? Again, right. Shmuel said it's fine, but the Brysa said it's a problem. So according to the Brysa's view, would that be a problem? Now, Shulchan Aruch brings this, uh, the law about having a double covering. So it talks about in the same room. So if we want to take this question and bring the question to the, to the more practical side, you have tefillin in the bedroom. Now, if one is together with his wife, but they're not planning on having relations, would they be allowed to sleep in that room with the tefillin without it being double covered? So that would be a practical question that would connect similar to your question. Right. And the law is that even if a woman is, even if you're together with your wife in bed, if you're not planning on having relations, it's not a problem. Okay. It's not a problem of, of um, uh, having the tefillin in the room and they're not double covered. So that might mean, it's, the Shulchan Aruch says that um, uh, it's considered like his wife is not with him, even though they're together, but they're not planning on having relations. So, um, so the Shulchan Aruch says that, um, that it's fine, and you wouldn't need to have the, the tefillin double covered. But the Taz argues, <laughs> the Taz uh, which is a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, says that um, um, uh, that uh, you would need the tefillin double cover. You can't be with your wife in bed until the tefillin is double covered, because maybe you'll forget and have relations. And the interesting thing is the Alter Rebbe, in his Shulchan Aruch, in, uh, he puts in, in parentheses, um, this, this, that it's proper to be, to be strict, uh, even though there's no prohibition from law, um, um, enough much is verb. Alpha PJ and Israel, but I didn't show him and I didn't want to leave you in a mystery. But it's proper to be more strict. It's interesting. He talks about it regarding Tishaba that, According to the letter of the law, a person would even be allowed to sleep with his wife on Tisha where you're not allowed to have relations, but uh, we're not afraid that a person will forget. So therefore, based on that, it seems like uh, it would logically be allowed to be in a room, to have tefillin in the room, even though a person is sleeping with his wife, but they're not planning on having relations, that it shouldn't be a problem. So that is the... Um, That is the, so, so according to the letter of the law, it seems okay, best to be more strict. Mm -hmm. Have the tefillin double covered or keep them in another room. Don't have them in the bedroom. Don't have your, your tefillin bag in your bedroom. Okay. Um, but I guess, you know, this could be practical in a, in a, if a person is, a, is in, a, uh, in a hotel room, uh, you know, and uh, uh, the tefillin, your tefillin are right there. So that could be an issue. They should be double covered. Someone did ask me about the uh, about the uh, tefillin bag, the talus bag. Could that be considered a double covering? And that is, uh, I was speaking to a rub this morning, and he 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 didn't give me an answer. So it sounds like a good question. Like maybe the talus bag should be considered like a second covering. I believe it should be uh, considered like a second covering for the um, for the tefillin, uh, and that should be good enough. Uh, but I don't want to say that unless I have a clear source. Yes, uh, Ezra. So when, when you're saying it's uh, the tefillin bag <clears throat> is inside the talus bag, so that would be the second yeah, cover? Yeah, it would be a second covering, I, I would think. And and the plastic bag, which is normally used to cover the tefillin bag, would be the third cover. That, that, that would also, if you have the pla if you have a plastic on top of it, I would, yeah, for, I would think for sure that should be like an extra uh, reason for uh, leniency, especially because the, the plastic right. bag, a lot of people put, put a pen in, you could put a, a mirror, you could put, who knows, you know, people put others, other items in it. So I would think it's not exclusive for, uh, in, you know, for tefillin 
or a talus, which I don't think a talus is an issue because according to the letter of the law, a talus could be brought into a bathroom, but it says nothing, it's proper not to. So it seems like, uh, um, uh, you know, like it should be considered a, a proper covering. So that, that's what it, sa- it seems to me that it should be okay. I would like to, um, you know, just get the, get, a, get another uh, uh, agreement from the, another rabbi to uh, the, agree. So yeah, yes, the, the right. question, and it doesn't matter whether the plastic is clear or not. Oh, so that's another interesting thing about the, the, the uh, if, if it's see-through. And, but it's, it's all reason, about being covered. It would seem right. that, it, that it's all about covering. That it's not, you know, the fact is it's covered, even though it's see-through. We're going to learn about Gemara, Gemara is about what about a covering that's see-through, uh, like er, um, uh, soya ba'ashashis or erva ba'ashashis, like, you know, this, uh, this is uh, an interesting question when it comes to the other, the other things that we're learning about, which is we're learning about if there's dirt in the room, there's excrement, what happens if that's covered? What about if it's covered with a see-through covering? The same thing applies if someone's clothed, but they're clothed with a see-through cloth. So these type of questions, can you say a bracha in front of someone who has, uh, uh, let's say, nylons that are sheer nylons? So they're, they're basically see-through. Would that be? A, would you be allowed to recite a bracha in front of someone? Who, you know, who's, they're clothed, but there's, but it's see through. What about some, you know, uh, glass covering? There's a, you know, someone's uh, behind the glass, uh, uh, so the, you don't, you know, there's a covering, but it's see through. But anyway, it would seem that the plastic shouldn't be a problem for tefillin. Uh, yeah, uh, let's see who uh, Ben Ben. Question. Yeah, I wanted to say, I think we studied earlier that uh, the bag itself of that film is not a considered a cover, but especially it, go, it was, they were talking about the size that has to yeah, be yeah, yeah. the tefach. Yeah, designated, yeah. Yeah, designated. Yeah. So I'm, it depends. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you bring that up because I, I looked into it. I, I had asked if anyone has the safer um, um uh, because I, I I saw it quoted, uh, I saw it quoted that uh, hello Ruvin. Um, uh, I saw it quoted that uh, if a person has a uh, extra space in their in their in their bag, what does it mean? You need to have an extra tefach to be considered um, uh, doable. To, to bring the tefillin into a bathroom in a, in, a, in, a, in a scenario where a person has no other choice whatsoever. They have tefillin and they have the bag of the tefillin, the tefillin bag, and that's it. Under dire circumstances, there's no other option. What would you be allowed to bring that tefillin into the bathroom? And so the Gemara that we learned said that you would be if it has a tefach space, even though the bag is designated for tefillin, but under dire circumstances, you could bring that tefillin bag into a bathroom if it has a tefach space. Now I saw quoted that that tefach means before the tefillin is in the bag, it's the size of a tefach. And so I said that, that's what it seems. I saw someone quoted it, that that's the, but I looked it up and I'm not impressed with the source. So I, I want to, believe that it means there's extra space at tefach, even though I, I quoted that that safer, oh. but I, I did uh, yesterday or two days ago, I looked it up and I saw that, I saw the source, it doesn't sound so convincing. And therefore it would seem to me that the tefach means it has to have extra space. If it's a bag that has extra space and most fill-in bags don't have an yeah. extra tefach of space in them, therefore it would be a problem to bring the tefillin into a bathroom without having that extra extra space or putting on tefillin on the floor and under dire circumstances without having that extra extra space of a tefach. It should be a bigger bag. Otherwise it should be a, a bag that's not, or you could have a bag that's not the tefillin bag. That would also be okay. Yeah, Again, double. So, so that uh, just uh, clarifies something that we learned before about having that extra tefach of space. Very interesting that it doesn't clarify in Shulchan Aruch what that tefach is, to what extent, how. So we're sort of uh, uh, left in the dark what, what exactly it means, but I believe it means an extra tefach um, be, be besides for the tefillin. Yeah, I think you said the tefach and tefach without the tefillin. Besides the tefillin. But oh, I, what tefach, I mean is, he, he, with the tefillin in the bag, 
there's an extra tefach of space yeah. with the tefillin in the bag, and you still have an extra tefach, an extra hand breadth of space. Okay, right. Susan. Do you is a tefillin considered a protection, just like the mezuzah? Well, to a certain extent, it's different. Tefillin is supposed to bring fear upon the nations of the world. It says, Viro kol all the nations of the world will see the head tefillin and they will be afraid. The Yaru Mineka, they will be afraid from you. So tefillin does have special powers of causing fear among the nations. So it's protection for safety for the Jewish people for uh, anti Semitic attacks and so on. But it's different than a mezuzah. A mezuzah is protection. Um, um, from the demon. Mezuzah is protection. I think for all for all matters, like tefillin is against the enemies of the Jews, it's going to cause fear I among see. the enemies. I see. The zuzah okay. causes safety in general, more general type of safety okay. um, for all for all types of issues. No one should fall. No one should get sick. No one should, you know, that's the a zuzah has that or international type of. Uh... The tefillin is about enemies. Yes. Zuzza has safety from all uh, issues. That's why it's very important to have people to check their mezuzahs. Uh, because, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the most value, it's the, most, the cheapest security you'll ever get for your house. And it's right. the most precious security you'll ever get. It's the best security and it's the cheapest. So don't, uh, you know, don't, don't miss out on this, uh, mezuzah opportunity. Right. So, I understand. And it's supposed Thank to be you. on every doorpost of your house besides for a bathroom. Closets. Yeah. So. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, so that I think clarifies uh, the uh, the laws of the uh, double covering. But the Gemara continues. The Gemara here. We're now on the uh, page twenty four a, and uh, we're going to start on the top of the page. Vehecha manach lehu. Where do you put the uh, tefillin when the person is sleeping? When it's under his pillow, or the Gemara is asking, what does it mean? It's under your head. Where where is it? Amar Rabbi Yirmiyah says, Ben Karla Kesses. It means it's between the mattress and the pillow. Shalei connected Reisha, opposite one's head. So, not, I'm sorry, Shalei connected Reisha, I didn't translate that word. Shalei connected Reisha, not opposite one's head, which means you're not allowed to have the tefillin under one's head, even if it's double wrapped. Um, it has to be under the pillow, but a little pushed over, pushed beyond where your head is. The Gemara asks a contradiction. Didn't Reb learn? We place it in its uh, container under one's head. So it sounds like you could actually put it under, under, under your head. And that's a contradiction to uh, the, the, um, the previous statement of Reb that it said, uh, you can't have it under your head. And here, the bride of Rebchia learned that it is under one's head. So the Gemara answers, uh, that he pushes the morsha, the kaiva, he pushes the um, bulging of the bag outside. So he's pushing it outside, meaning it's he's sleeping on top of the bag of the tefillin. But the actual bulging of the tefillin boxes are pushed uh, beyond his head, which logically would make sense. You don't want to, it's not going to be that comfortable sleeping on top of the bulging boxes of the square tefillin. But uh, I, I guess if you have a big enough pillow, maybe it doesn't make a difference. So the Gemara here is saying that you have to push those, the boxes further. You can't really sleep on the box of the tefillin. Uh, you push it beyond where your head is and you stick it out. But you can sleep on the bag of the tefillin because you're just pushing the bulging part of the bag outside, out. out, out. Yes, uh, Ben. I just wanted to say that in the olden days, the pillows had only some feathers or puch. They did not have those new materials that are a little harder. Uh -huh. so for sure, you cannot sleep on pointy rocks, you know. Right. Or, or on right. film bag. Yeah. Right, right. Well, you know, there used to be uh, a, a, a pathway in Yiddishkeit to like cause suffering to yourself. And that was like an atonement. So maybe that would be why someone would want to do that. Sleep on top of the tefillin as a like atonement for their sins. You know? Anyway, 
So uh, now the Gemara says, Bar Kapara Tirle Bechilasa. Bar Kapara covered, uh, wrapped the tefillin in the kilo, which is a uh, some type of a curtain that was uh, on top of his bed. And uh, um, around around the bed, they, he would have he had a curtain, and uh, he tied it there. Tzi means like to tie it uh, in that in that curtain. Umapik lemurshain lebar, and he would push this this uh, bulging part um, um, outside of the of the of the bed. So that's how uh, you know he. Uh, did not sleep. Uh, the Gemara is basically showing either that he it's considered a double covering, or uh, he pushed it out so it wasn't uh, it wasn't um, uh, under his head. He made sure you know not to sleep under his head with it. Um, it was it was or uh, maybe it's talking about that it was with his wife, and uh, if he had it that way, as long as it's double covered, it's okay. Okay, then the Gemara says, Rav Shisha breed Rav Idi, Manach Luash Arshifa. He placed it on a, uh, on a bench. Upara Sudra Ilavayu, when he put a Sudr, which is a, like a kerchief over it, some type of a, uh, a cloth over it. So that's how Rav Shisha put his tefillin when he went to sleep. Amar Rav Avnuna. Rav Avnuna says, "Read Rav Yosef, and, uh, the son of Rav Yosef." Zim nechad avukim nechami de Rava. I was once in front of Rava. V'amar Ali, and he told me, "Zil icy tefillin. Go bring me tefillin." But I'm, which means, he, like, you know, he had left his tefillin in his house, and he told his, his student, "Go or his friend, uh, go, you know, go, I guess his student, uh, 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 you know, bring me the uh, the bring me my tefillin." And uh, and I found the tefillin ben Carla Kessis. It was between the mattress and the pillow. Shalai Kenegad Reishay, not where his head was. I guess where his head was on the side. Yadana the Yom and I knew that it was the day of Tvila. I knew it was the the, the, the that the night before his wife went to mikvah, and uh, I learned from there Lagmur and Halacha Lamaisa who David. He did this. Why did he tell me to get his tefillin? Not because he forgot them at home, but because he wanted me to learn a halacha that you are allowed to sleep with your tefillin under your bed, under your head, under your headrest, um, um, and be with one's wife. That's what he was teaching me. In other words, he was teaching me a practical halacha. It's not enough to just teach a halacha. Here he was showing me practically because uh, uh, the tefillin was the tefillin was uh, under his pillow, and obviously it's allowed. Now, uh, the question is, how did he know that this is a Yom Tvila of his wife? How would, how would this student know that his wife went to Mikvah the night before? So therefore, there's an explanation here that it means that the, 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 the Rav went to Mikvah the next, the, 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 the morning. It was Yom Tvila, it was a day of Tvila. Which means, this means that the, um, uh, the, the story uh, that Rabbi Yosef uh, I'm sorry, the story of Rav Amnuna, Bereder of Yosef, Rav Amnuna, son of Rav Yosef, who uh, was uh, in front of Rava, and he brought Rava's tefillin. He knew that Rava went to Mikvah the next morning, th- that morning. So that's why it says, um, I knew that it was a Yom Tvila. It was Yom Tvila, the day of Tvila for, the, for Rava. Rava had gone to Mikvah that day. And so I knew that he must have been with his wife the night before because Rava did not have a wet dream. He didn't have any, he didn't masturbate Chas So of course he was with his wife. That's why he went to Mikvah. So since I knew he was with his wife, I knew he went to Mikvah, I knew he was with his wife. And therefore when I went to check out his tefillin, where's tefillin when I went to bring him his tefillin and I saw that they were under his pillow, I, in the, but the, not where his head was, I understood that that's the halacha, that you be with your wife and have the tefillin not under your, of course, it's double covered. Don't, you know, don't, don't forget, we're, we're dealing with double covered, but still, it's still not appropriate to be under, uh, under one's head, but it could be under the pillow if there's no other option and we're afraid of <clears throat> ganovim, we're afraid of, uh, of, um, of the mice and so on. Okay, boy, mine Rav Yosef. Rabbi Yosef, the son of Rabbi Nechunya, asked Rabbi Yehuda a question. 
two people are um, uh, sleeping in one bed. Mahu, mahu, what is the din? Mahu shazay yachzir panav yikro kriyashma, shazay yachzir panav yikro kriyashma. What is the din if one person faces one way? In other words, the problem is they don't have clothing. Very sad. That's the way it used to be. People suffered, struggled financially, and uh, they didn't have pajamas. So what did they do? They would go to sleep without any clothing under a sheet. But the thing is, um, how do they say Shema? So it, you have two people in the same bed. They, they obviously didn't have money for a second bed, never a bigger apartment. So they're sleeping in the same bed. And um, and uh, they want to they, they say Shema. So, so the question is, if they face each other is a problem, because then they're basically... Um, um, either seeing each other's uh, private area, which is prohibited to recite. With. But if they face the opposite direction, it's not a problem. If they face each other, it's also a problem. Their body is touching uh, you know, the other person's body. The private area is being, is being is touching. So basically, they have to sit back, back to back. Back to back. What uh, makes, th- what then, makes you think they had a blanket? Oh, so the, the, the problem is that... Um, a person is not allowed to see his own erva, his own uh, private area in, say, a bracha. You can't say Shema when you're naked. So what do you, so it must be talking about um, that not only did they have a blanket, but they stuck their head outside of the blanket. So, because if they stuck their head in the blanket, then their head sees their, uh, their uh, erva. So it must be talking about that the head is outside of the blanket. So the blanket is covering between their head and their private area. However, the problem is that um, um, are they allowed to say Shema in that way? And um, and, uh, and and the Gemara answers, oh, there is one more problem. There's two problems with one is what, what Isaac asked, is the head sees the erva. Your head is not allowed to see, so that's a, not a problem. Your, your, your head is outside of your, of the, of the, of the... You um, can't close of, your eyes. It's, if it's exposed, it doesn't mean that you necessarily can't see it, but if you are in a shameful situation or position... Right, if it's in front of you. If it's in front of you. Fine, but here you're facing the opposite direction. So here you're facing the opposite direction. But the problem is your heart is not allowed to see the uh, private area. So what does that mean? Basically, it's brought in Shulchan Aruch. I, I, I don't think a lot of people know this, but the Alter Rebbe explains it more than, uh, more than it's explained, I think, elsewhere. And he says that, um, that a person, their head in their heart, the place where Hashem rests in them, the rabbis were moisif, that the place that Hashem rests in them, which is the head and the heart of a person, those places should not see their private area. So the head can't see your private area, and the heart can't see your private area. How do you separate the head in the heart from seeing your private area. So very simple. If you have a tight belt, a belt that you wrap tightly around your waist, so as long as it's a little snug, it's considered uh, origartal. Uh, you're considered uh, separating between your um, your uh, heart and your private area or your head and your private area. So that is, um, so they shouldn't be, um, together with the private area without any separation. Practically speaking, if you wear a pair of underwear, so the strap uh, of the underwear is uh, blocking uh, between the area. Uh, of course, uh, with underwear, you're covering your whole uh, private area. But even without the, uh, the whole pair of underwear, without the whole underwear, just, the, just that, that tight uh, elastic that's around the underwear, that, cover, that separates between your heart and your uh, private area. That's... So um, that covers this, but the reason for it is because the places that Hashem rests in you, 
the head and the heart of a person. This is in the Alter Rebbe Shulchan Aruch, chapter 74. And, um, uh, and that's the reason for not that the heart shouldn't see the earth. So Taisvis over here asks, you're in a bed, uh, two people, they are reciting the Shema, and the, 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 the head is outside of the bed, but what about the heart? The heart is, sees the erva. You have, no, you have no pajamas on. You have no underwear on. You're, so, so, so what do you do in that case? So the answer is that he says it must be talking about that you, you have some type of a, uh, you're pushing maybe with, the, uh, with, uh, with this uh, cover and tightening it around where your heart is, and that would be considered a separation between your heart, or maybe you have some type of a gartel that you could put on but you don't have pajamas, but you have maybe a gartel, or maybe this opinion holds, you don't need, it's not a problem. The heart seeing the private area is not a problem. So those are the answers that Taisus gives, but that's what we're dealing with the person. They want to say Shema, they're on a bed with two people, and uh, they're just going to not face each other in order to be able to say Shema. Yes, uh, David. Yeah, I just want to make a, a comment on what you were answering before um, to Susan about the difference between the tefillin and a mezuzah, as far uh -huh. as protect, as far as protection, okay. So that the so that the tefillin are giving chitas, they're putting fear into the into the nations, so that they don't harm the Jews. But that's more of a side effect. It's not the reason for the tefillin. The tefillin is to bind the head and the heart, like you're referring to now, to Hashem. It happens to be a side effect that it also puts fear into the. So it's not for protection that we're wearing to fill them. We're wearing to fill them to bind our heart and head to Hashem. Good point. Good point, David. I, I, I didn't, I should have maybe uh, 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 expressed that, uh, that idea. Um, Rabbi, I don't mean to put you on spot when I ask you these out of the ordinary questions. It's just, I'm very curious. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, no, it's good to I know. I don't mean to disrupt the class. I wanted to make that clear. Okay, don't worry. No, it's very good. Oh, these are David, good David has a good point that the mezuzah yeah. has an intrinsic element of 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 the, the the purpose of the mezuzah is to protect, in addition to being a mitzvah. But it, there, there is a concept that it that it protects as part that the mitzvah is to protect you. Put the mezuzah on your door to give you protection. There is such a concept within the mitzvah itself. Now, obviously, you're not allowed to do it because of protection, you don't put the mezuzah, you have to do it because it's a, a mitzvah, but the mezuzah does have that intrinsic uh, element, while the other, while tefillin is more of a fringe benefit. And that's that's not even, it's not part of the main um, uh, point of the of the, um, of the tefillin. Yes, uh, Ezra. Okay. Yeah, but if you look at the previous page, Ubi Yochanan basically wouldn't give his tefillin to his, when he went to the bathroom and he uses the term because because it protects me and he's not wearing tefillin he's holding it in his hand so how do you how do you explain that aspect i'm not sure what you're asking you're saying it, it even it does have protection in general yes because he asking. says you know he does have give, does he have wouldn't protection. give them to his he wouldn't give them to his students right so it does have more up. than just it does have protection more than just the enemies. It does protect from demons. It's a holy item and it kicks away demons. So uh, that's true. There's more than just protection from enemies. It uh, seems to kick away demons. I'm not sure uh, how far to take that. Again, it's it's not the intrinsic. It's not the intrinsic goal of the tefillin to kick away enemy to kick away demons, but it is a fringe benefit uh, of the tefillin. But you're right, I should add that point, that it does more than just uh, um, make enemies be afraid. It does, it does help against demons. Isaac, you're not comfortable with that? If it's in your jacket, it also protects against bullets. <laughs> I doubt it. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Yes, Ben. ben. I, think, I think he didn't mean it's going to protect him in the bathroom. He means it's going to protect him when he's wearing it, but he likes to to keep it with him. No, no, no. Uh, Ezra is correct that it, it did say that, that it's going to help him. It's going to protect him from the, uh, the from the demons. We saw that on the top Rashi on page 23B, the top Rashi. Okay. Even if he's not wearing it. If he's yeah, even if he's not wearing it. it. Yep. Okay. So, uh, um, 
Yes. A fight in which you are not involved and a bullet comes at you is a demon. I don't know how else, you know, uh -huh. they talk okay, about okay. these things. Right. Okay, okay. Uh, sounds good. So um, let's let's go a little further. So we so we're talking about they're they're in bed without pajamas and they are reciting the Shema. I want to know if you're allowed to. Amalei Haki Amar Shmuel said, "This is what Shmuel said: Ba'afilu Ishta Imay. Even if his wife is with him, that would be allowed. They face the opposite directions. If they would face face to face, for sure would be prohibited because there's a an issue of hear her of thought because when they're a uh, private area is touched, um, uh, it would be a problem of having negative thoughts, but the opposite way, facing the opposite direction, is not a problem. Now, Maskifla Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef asks a question based on something that the Gemara says in numerous places, that Ishtoi Kagufai, a person's wife, is like himself. Ishtai Kagufai. It's, it's a statement that applies in, in, in other areas as well. Um, here we're using it to show that when a person is, um, he's already enjoyed, um, been together with his wife uh, before, the, he doesn't have the same <clears throat> lust um, that would make him sin. In other words, under normal circumstances, a person would not be allowed to be with their wife when she is a nida, when she is menstruating. You nor under normal circumstances, according to uh, uh, I shouldn't say normal under acad under the law under the academic law rules, according to the the uh, logic of Torah laws, a person shouldn't be with their wife. They shouldn't be allowed to be in the same room because she is prohibited to him. That with a very serious sin of arias, it's considered a, a sin of immorality, um, adultery. Uh, it's uh, being together with a wife who's menstruating or hasn't gone to mikvah from when she menstruates. That should be prohibited. Why is it permitted? The reason it's permitted is because he's rugilba. He's familiar with her. He's going to have her at a later time when she is permissible to him. They're going to be permitted later on after she goes to marry. So he's able to control himself. The lusts, the desires are not too strong for him to handle. So the same thing is here. What we're talking about is his wife is with him in bed. Their backs are to each other. So his body is touching her body. And um, would they be allowed to recite Shema in that way? They don't own pajamas. And uh, would they be allowed to recite Shema? So one rabbi said, yeah, no problem, even with one's wife, whether it's a, a roommate or a person's boy, you know, a person's, uh, uh, you know, his, his friend, his yeshiva, yeshiva friend, or whether it's with his wife. However it is, it's permissible to say Shema that way, even if it's with his wife. The other rabbi says, what do you mean, even with your wife? With your wife makes a lot more sense that it should be permissible because you're familiar with her already. You don't have the same, you're not going to have the same <laughs> thoughts that you might have if you're with someone else, if you're with another man, but still the thoughts come when your bodies are touching, it could cause there to be thoughts. With a person's wife is less. So this rabbi thinks that you would have less thoughts with your wife. And the other rabbi seemed to think the opposite that you would have more thoughts. So that's the Gemara's uh, discussion here. Maskif la Rabbi Yosef, we're now two lines up from the wide lines. Rabbi Yosef asked, Ishtai v'lemi boy acher? You think um, you're allowed to say Shema with your wife in that scenario? And for sure, it's no question, someone else for sure would be permissible. Adarabba, I think the opposite. Ishtai is kagufai. A person's wife is like him. He's familiar with her. He's used to her. And therefore his thoughts won't uh, lead to any sin, sinful thoughts. Acher lav kagufai, a person, another person is not like his body, meaning he's not uh, familiar with that person. <laughs> and therefore, it could lead to other thoughts, and, and that would be possibly a problem. With one's wife, this would be permissible to say Shema in this type of way. So the Gemara, that, that's the Gemara's 
basically answer. One rabbi says it's permissible with everyone, even one's wife. And the other rabbi seems to imply that it's only with one's wife that it would be permissible, but others would be prohibited. And now the Gemara is going to have a mesve, a contradiction from a brisa. Yes, uh, Susan. Is, uh, is it okay if the wife and the husband are say this not together? However they want. However they want. There's no, okay. And also in reference to- As long to, as they hear themselves, the words that they're saying. You know, right. sometimes when pe two people say the same words, it's hard for someone to concentrate, to hear their words. Right. But, uh, but, but whispering, uh, they're whispering. Right, I mean. they say it. Yeah. Okay, Mesve. Yeah. The Gemara asks a contradiction. Two people are sleeping in one bed. This one faces that direction and reads the Shema. The other one faces the other direction and reads the Shema. We have another Brisa. A person sleeping in a bed. And his uh, family, his kids, his, his household members are next to him. They need to have a talus, so some type of a cloak. Uh, between them. They, they need to have a separation. <laughs> if they're very little, then it's mutter, then it's permissible. If they're little, then it's permissible. So we have a contradiction. Are you allowed to say Shema naked uh, next to someone else who's naked facing the opposite directions? Or do you need to have a, a type of garment or something separating between the two of them? So the, the Gemara says that according to Rabbi Yosef, it's not a contradiction. It's not a contradiction according to Rabbi Yosef because Rabbi Yosef said, made, a, made a differentiation between one's wife where it's more permissible and other people <coughs> and it would be a problem. <laughs> you could say one brisa that says it's uh, permissible is talking about his wife. The other brisa that says you need to have a, a garment that would be someone else. Th 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 there you need a, a garment to separate. But according to Shmuel, it would be a kasha because according to Shmuel, everyone is permitted. How could you? How, so, so there's no scenario where it's uh, where it would be prohibited. So why would one brisa obligate you to have a uh, garment that separates you, a cloak separating the two? It must. Be. In other words, it's a real contradiction. So the Gemara says uh, Shmuel answers this question. Amalach Shmuel Shmuel. Tells, can tell you, the Rabbi Yosef Minecha, is it really good according to Rabbi Yosef? If you look at the words, it doesn't really flow according to Rabbi Yosef either. Now, this assumably is, is the, it, it's the, um, the same brisa, it just says the word slightly differently. If you look back at the brisa, it was um, one word. Hayashin, or here it says Hayashin. Let's see the base. Let's see if the Bach fixes it. Hayashin Bamita. Okay. Anyway, Hayashin Bamita, Uvanov Nebesa Bamita. La Yikra Kriyashma. So it says, person is saying she's lying in his bed, and his household members are in his bed. He shouldn't say Shema. LMT Nice Talisa Mapsek Bene. So you see pretty clearly that it says B'nai Beisai, his household members. And it doesn't differentiate. It would seem like the, the household members are his wife. So if it said household members, the wife is included. So basically, we're going to have to say that the wife is not, according to the second Brisa, is not allowed to say Shema if one is with his wife in the uh, under a cover, uh, facing the opposite directions. So obviously, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a contradiction over here. There's definitely a contradiction here. And therefore, we'll have to say that it's two different sources, two different rabbis who argued in the sources of each of these prices, the, the, the author, excuse me, not the source, the author of each of these prices are different people. And therefore, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a problem because they each held differently. One rabbi felt that you need to have a cloak separating the two of you. And the, well, the other rabbi said it's not a problem. So... So he says, according to Rabbi Yosef, is it good? You have this brisa. Elamayis lach lameimar ishtay le Rabbi Yosef tanaihi. What are you going to say? According to Rabbi Yosef, you'll have to say that one's wife, according to Rabbi Yosef, is going to be an argument between the tanoim. The didi nami, according to me, also not only a wife but anyone is a tanoihi. It's an argument between the tanoim. Is it allowed or is it not allowed? And so it comes out that Shmuel would hold that this would be allowed. 
Amar Mar, Master said, let's go a little further. Master said, You could say the Shema lying back to back. Now, the question is, but you have the buttocks. Now that touching each other could be, the Gemara thinks that maybe that is an issue of erva, of an area that's uh, like private. So maybe this follows the opinion of Rav Huna, Rav Huna, Rav Huna says, no, that's not a problem. It's only the uh, the private area in the front is a problem. This maybe fits with another statement uh, that, uh, th- let's say that this uh, um, uh, agrees with Rav Huna, a Mishnah in Masech uh, Chala. The Mishnah over there says that a woman, it says a woman would be allowed to separate Chala. There's, there's a different... There's a different uh, that a woman, even if she doesn't have clothing, if she sits down, her private area is covered. But a man would not, it would not be covered, even if he sits down, because the private area would um, would still be visible. So therefore, it's, it says a halacha in the laws of challah that um, that uh, uh, that a woman would be allowed to separate challah even if she's even if she doesn't have clothing on it. And because she could cover herself um, with, in the ground, which means if she's sitting down, it's not a problem. And she, uh, uh, she, would, she would be allowed to do this mitzvah and separate challah and even recite the bracha uh, because her private area is covered. But a man would not be allowed to do that. So, so you see from there that her, why aren't we concerned that her, her backside is not fully covered? So you see that the backside is not considered an issue of erva. So the Gemara says, no, it's not a proof because it could be when she's sitting in the ground and she's sitting in the earth. So it's softer. So it really is covering her, the, 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 uh, it's, it's covering her completely, her, her, her backside. So therefore, it's only the front side that would be an issue of saying a bracha, and therefore, it's not a problem when the two people are back to back with each other, saying Shema, and even though according to, uh, you, you're normally not allowed to have uh, touching, anyone, uh, anything touching, any any organ touching, uh, or any any other person touching your, uh, your private area uh, when you're saying the Shema, and the the the, uh, the the problem here, it's not a problem because it, they're back to back. Amar Mar, Zem Achzir Panav Kari Piyeshma. No, I, I just read that. Amar Mar, Im Hayu Panav Nebesei Ketane Mutter. So we said before that if they're if they were under age, then it's permissible to to recite the Shema with them, even if there's no talis, even if there's no Cloak separating between them. So, Ba'ad Kama, what age? Amar Rav Chizda. So, Rav Chizda, initial, the, 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 there's two opinions here. There's two st- uh, understandings. One is Rav Chizda says, is If girl is a girl is w- w- one of your daughters is under three, but Tinaik ben test or, or a boy under nine years old, that would be the age where there is no, uh, that we wouldn't cause any thoughts. Ika Damri and others say Tinaika is Bas Yudalov Shana by a female eleven the, the age is eleven. Viamechot the Tinaik Ben Shte Mesri Shana Viamechot and by a male it's twelve. That's when the age where a person would um, um, would uh, have yeah sort of like mature. So Ed the Ed and both of them Ad Kadei Shadayim Nachinu Saruch Tzimeach. Mm-hmm. That the time is until that once that stage arrives, um, um, that shadayim nachinu that the breaths are um, uh, fully uh, developed in saarech tzimeach the hair grows that would be the uh, end that would be it would be too late in other words they're too old to be able to sleep without a cloak. Uh, separating. Over there, 
in the earlier page, we said the halacha follows Shmuel, even though we proved him wrong. Hacha mai. Over here, what is the halacha by two people sleeping that Shmuel says with the person's wife per, that would be permissible? What would be the halacha? Are you going to put everything together in one uh, uh, one uh, weaving? You're going to weave everything together just because over there we we pass in like Shmuel. Does that mean uh, we're going to? And even though the, we proved him wrong, the halacha follows him everywhere. Where we where we learn that the halacha is like him, that's the that halacha follows him. Where we didn't learn the halacha is like him, we don't we don't know. Amalei Rab Mary the Rab Papa Saar Yoitzi Bebigdei. Mahu. If here is uh, um, is sticking out of a hole in one's garment, so the here from below is that considered erva to say shema? Is that a problem? In other words, is the here uh, below is that considered one's private area? The here from one's private area is that considered erva? So. Uh, Kara alei sayer sayer. Ah, it's just here. What's what's the here? Here is nothing. Here doesn't isn't considered erva. Okay, I think we're going to stop here. Um, want to wish you all a very good Shabbos. Zay gesund. Zay gesund. Good Shabbos. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Good Shabbos. Rabbi, can I make one comment to you? Yeah, yeah, Ben. Yeah. I wanted to say maybe the three-year-old for a girl is coming from Rivka. That met uh -huh. Isaac at three year old. Uh huh. And nine could be for Chinuch, for the for the boy. That's where those two comes from. Well, the other comes the from the change. Uh, according to according to halacha, there is something unique about the age nine and the age three. The age three for a girl, it says if if a girl loses her virginity before the age of three, it grows back. If she loses it after the age of three, it doesn't grow back. The age of nine is when a boy has the ability to have an erection, to be able to, 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 to have relations. In other words, a, a full erection. Uh, before the age of nine, a boy would not be of age. His, his relations would not be considered relations. And uh, so that's the, that's, uh, I think that's the reason for these. Yeah, but I'm saying, I'm saying we're seeing it with Rivka at age three. Uh, yeah, good point. Good, definitely a, a, a nice point there. That uh, there's some connection why she, why age three was she was of age to, um, you know, initially meet Isaac. Uh, meet Isaac. Okay, good, good, good thought. Yeah, definitely. Okay, Zaygazunt, everyone. <coughs> Thank, Thank you, Rabbi.